Welcome to the Sharing the Faith podcast, where every other week we explore the beauty and power of faith in Jesus Christ, the light of the world. Now here is your host, Dr. Tom Neal. Well, hello, everyone. This is Dr. Tom Neal again. Thank you so much for joining us for another edition of Sharing the Faith, a podcast production of the Diocese of Pensacola, Tallahassee. And yet again, I get to have the pleasure of having guests with me to share conversation. And today, I I must tell you, before we recorded here, I already laughed more than I've laughed in probably two weeks, just in the few minutes with my guests here today, who are just dear friends, wonderful human beings, just wonderful human beings. And if I could say this show is, is, is what is this show about? This show is the chance to introduce to you the wonderful human beings I know. Um, who are lights of Christ and lights in my life. So so these two people here, Michael and Tasha Haverkamp, uh, are that for me. Um, and they both live right now in Davenport, Iowa, which is a lovely town in the east side of Iowa. My wife and f- children and I used to live in Des Moines for a number of years, and we didn't know at the time each other. So unfortunately, I didn't realize I was so close to these people I would become friends with one day. Um, but they're going to join us today to talk about, well, I asked them to talk about their marriage and uh, how faith has uh, mixed into their marital life. Uh, so I'd like them to share their story of their beginnings of their marriage relationship and then some of, you know, some ex- examples from their life of how faith has particularly shaped the way that they live their marriage out. Uh, and I, I'm doing this because you, you, I won't have to explain it. I, at the end of the show, you'll understand why I chose these two people. Marvelous people. I, I met Michael. I'm sorry I'm talking so much, by the way, Mr. and Mrs. Haverkamp. But I met Michael, um, uh, well, I think it's, is it four years ago now, Michael, that I mm-hmm. met you on the phone. And Michael and I uh, were connected uh, through a mutual friend, had a conversation. And after that conversation, I said to myself, I have a brother for life right now that I didn't know yet. And now I got, I got to, I get to know him. And then I got to meet his wife eventually. And one day when my wife and Tasha and Michael and I are all together, a quantum event will happen and the second coming will occur. <laughs> so that's why we haven't seen each other yet, because we're trying to give you a little more time to repent. <laughs> um, so uh, I'm going to have Michael and Tasha actually say something now after about 10 minutes of me talking. Uh, there they are in their living room in their house. Behind them is their fireplace, a picture of their family. Uh, and their dog is behind them. You can't see their dog. And you can see Tasha and Michael. And especially what I want to point out is the mustache. It's really a remarkable thing. Michael? What this episode is really going to be about. Really, the whole thing is is kind of the history of mustaches. <laughs> <laughs> and, and how and much I envy the mustache because yeah. I couldn't do it. <laughs> Yes, you could. You could totally pull it off. I can't. I tried it. It's very wiry. (laughs) And there's a big gap in the middle. (laughs) Okay. So what I want to do is is introduce these two two wonderful people. Let me just say, Michael, just kind of superficial introduction. Michael works as the director of Catholic Relations at Young Life, which is an international 80-plus-year-old kind of evangelical-founded organization that serves youth throughout the world. It's extraordinary. And it's an ecumenical organization, which means it includes Catholics, Protestants, and Orthodox together working to serve, uh, to bring Christ to our youth throughout the world. Uh, And uh, Tasha works at St. Paul Catholic Church in Davenport, Iowa, as the Director of Evangelization and Mission, which is my title here. So Tasha and I share background there. Tasha has a master's degree from Aquinas Institute and from SLU, uh, St. Louis University two master's degrees, and Dr. Michael Haverkamp has a doctorate in Christian spirituality uh, and has a master's degree in systematic theology. Quite an extraordinary background these two have. So now I will let them speak for themselves. Would you just give a little introduction to like a snapshot of where you're at right now in life, yourselves, your family, and so on? I would love to hear from you now. You go. go. Okay. Well, we're married. I was counting it up. It's almost 18 years. It'll be in in September. We've been married and uh, we have four children. So our oldest is 15, then we have a 12-year-old, 10-year-old, and 6-year-old. And our 6-year-old just recently, he's in a full leg cast right now because we are parents of the year. And uh, we let him bounce <laughs> on a trampoline, <clears throat> and he subsequently broke his leg. So that's that's kind of where we are in life and this week. 
<laughs> and how about your dog? Oh, yeah. And our dog, yeah. Mm-hmm. And our dog, Jovi, you know, who's around oh, here yep. somewhere. She'll Looking make an appearance. Squirrels. Yes, <laughs> she'll make an appearance for sure. Wonderful. Well, so what I want to start with, uh, Michael and Tasha, is the story of your marriage. Just maybe you could just tell however, whatever version you prefer, which is the is Tasha's version or Michael's version of how you met, fell in love, and then got married. Well, she always refers to this as the two versions, uh, my version and the truth. The truth. And so <laughs> I'll, I'll... let's well, stick with your version. It's probably more interesting. Okay. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll start and then she'll correct uh, as that's the, that's the, that's the motif of our marriage. Um, but Perfect. she, you know, we, we met in graduate school and uh, I was single at the time and I'd been single for a while. And so, you know, of the many things that were on my mind, I was at least curious about whether I would find, you know, like my future wife, you know, like when I was in, in grad school. So we met in St. Louis and before I met her, I, I asked around. You know, the part I, don't I was like, <clears throat> I was like, so, you know, like what is kind of the situation, you know, with girls down in, in this, in the school. And, uh, I had a friend who was happily married and this sounds way creepier when I tell it than it really was, but he said, well, there's, <laughs> this, there's this one. And, uh, I was like, oh, you know, and, uh, he, and the more he described this, this one student, uh, the more interested I was. And she, you know, she was doing a couple of master's degrees. She was from Iowa. That was interesting to me. But he described her as really top shelf. So and I'm ridiculous. like, Ooh, what does that mean? It's like, well, she's got really hard to, you know, approach, you know, like, and I was like, oh my gosh, like it's on. And so I, I thought I would find her. And uh, naturally, it was not a huge like campus. And, uh, and I didn't, I would just see rare sightings of, of her. She was like a Himalayan <laughs> snow leopard or something. I'd have so to ca- capture, <laughs> capture her on camera or something. But, um, but eventually, you know, I, I had he made up a story. This is where I'll tell you the truth, yeah. Tom. He worked in the <laughs> office. Um, and so he kind of, he kind of like cornered me into a situation where I was stuck. So he was, he was setting up prospective visits with new students. And so because I was in this new dual degree program, I was often asked to be a part of it. And so he supposedly got a new student who was going to be in my program and then very quickly emailed me to set up a lunch so that the three of us could get together for a tour. And ironically, the night before this was set to happen, the student who still, we joke about his name, Mark Yablonski is his name, um, <laughs> called and broke his leg and couldn't come to campus. But Michael had said to me, you're planning on tomorrow, right? And I was like, yep. And he's like, well, by the way, the student that was supposed to come can't. So I had no out. So I was kind of like wow, pigeonholed just just lunch with this man. <laughs> Mark Yablonski <laughs> exists. And I know when this this goes viral, <laughs> he will hear this. Please reach out to us. Reach yeah, Mark. Mark. We tried to invite to our <laughs> friends. Because but, we owe you our marriage. But it was the joke at college. That's but I, I will say, Tom, um, we sat down to lunch that first day and Michael prayed for our meal. And it was the first time I'd ever met somebody who prayed spontaneously. And I've been Catholic my whole life. And wow. something in me kind of turned in that moment. And the Lord is really doing a work on my heart at that season in my life too, to draw me back to him and closer to him. And so to meet somebody who was truly so evangelical and Catholic um, was just, it was, there, there was, it was an immediate draw to this man. So um, wow. it was pretty quickly that we knew that we were called to be together. So that first lunch was pretty explosive. <laughs> okay. Moving on. <laughs> <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> Nothing well, more, more commentary on that comment there, Michael. Maybe <laughs> I didn't, that I didn't sounds like the actual that. part of the yeah, podcast. <laughs> yeah, whole nother pot. No, it was yeah. a great. It was great. I mean, I was, I was very drawn, you know, to to her, you know, from from the beginning, and we we connected, you know, like really, really well. So we fell in love, and you know, uh, it was it was a wonderful time, you know, of of falling in love and. And trying to put God first at the same time, you know, mm-hmm. like all in love, you're not in control. And, uh, you know, like it was so it was so powerful and it was so right and so real. And of course, now, you know, the, we're, we're married and the, and the story tells itself. But, man, we, we had to we had to kind of draw back a few times mm-hmm. and just to make sure that I'm not f- too fixated just on you. Yeah. 
you know, that I, that my heart is still like com- completely like devoted to, to the Lord. And, uh, and that was, that was hard. Yeah. I remember early on in our relationship, there was a period of time where Michael's like, we, I think we need to take a pause and really lean into the Lord and make sure that this is what he wants for us. Not just what we want for ourselves because human emotion. Can be so it can just, you know, masquerade things that might not be there, but I would say in that time, and it became even more clear, like in prayer and discernment that we were called together and that this unity was ordained by God, given just who we were and what we were needing from each other. So that clarity came, but clearly because he was leading spiritually and helping us to kind of seek the right answers. So it's good. Mm. And you got married. Where did you get married? Your actual wedding? <clears throat> in my home parish. I grew up in a town of 350 people and there's one Catholic church um, and so it's this beautiful old church and, you know, traditional Catholic, you go back home and get married. I mean, we didn't have, we weren't living there or anything like that, but all of the festivities ha- happened around this little town, Templeton, Iowa. So it's mm. known for its uh, moonshine whiskey. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. is that, oh, is that right? <laughs> it really is. Templeton rye. Mm-hmm. Yeah. For That's all of your cool. whiskey drinking listeners, you know, they'll out know. there, they'll know. Mm-hmm. They'll, they'll totally know. Yep. Very cool. So, okay. So, so I know there's so much more at the beginning of your relationship, but I want to maybe broaden out, kind of go up a little higher in the sky and look out at your larger life of your marriage story and your family life. Obviously you had children, you have four beautiful children. Um, and, and how did faith, maybe you could share some examples, anecdotes of how faith has shaped your marriage, you know, the joys and the hopes, the griefs and anxieties, you know, as Gaudium it says, beautifully says, all those things in your life that make marriage and life what it is how has faith like spoken into that so maybe you could just share some stories of your own journey mm-hmm. you go first or you want to go on. um <clears throat> i think first and foremost that the sort of the non-negotiable for us is that our union is covenantal um it's a covenant and there's there's such i so appreciate michael because the honor and the loyalty from him is bar none i just can't even emphasize how loyal he is and how important that is to us um and to me, and I grew up in a home, you know, Michael comes, we both come from different family backgrounds. And I think the experience of a divorce convicted him. And I think the experience of my family, my parents are still married. And no matter what, I never doubted that they would be together forever. And I still to this day know that. And so I think for both of us coming in that that commitment piece is so strong that um, everything we can do to to stay committed to each other. And that's this is we're together. We're one forever. And that's the way it's going to be. Um, but that doesn't come without challenges. And so I will say that given, and I'll just speak for you, but I think given the context of where Michael came from, he's so proactive at addressing things and digging in into the hard spaces um, without just kind of riding the waves into um, a lack of growth, so to say. And so he's really pushed me in a good way to like dig into some of those uncomfortable places that you come up against in marriage um, that I probably would have been prone to run away from or was mm-hmm. scared to address. Um, but because of the commitment piece, it's easier to go there when it's safe and to dig into some of these things and heal in the process. So. Know, yeah. And I mean, like I, the, from the very beginning, like even uh, before we were married, I, I'll never forget, like we were, we were just reflecting on mercy uh, mm-hmm. over the last week. Cause it was divine mercy Sunday, you know, like last Sunday. And, uh, you know, we were, we were talking about, like, what are some concrete experiences that you've had of divine mercy? And and it was so clear to me, like what one of the most uh, concrete examples is, is, is an experience with Tasha, like before we were married. But I want I knew that I want to ask her for her hand in marriage. I knew that I want to marry her. And um, but I knew that if I was going to ask her, I would have to she'd have to know everything. And, you know, I lived, uh, you know, away from the Lord for, for many years. I, I had rebelled from the Lord, you know, in, in all the, you know, typical, you know, ways. But I, I really felt like if, if I was going to ask her and she would be able to, to say, you know, to, to answer uh, with integrity, she had to know. And I was so f- afraid. I remember going over to her house, driving over to her house. I'm walking up to her her apartment. I'm already shaking, like physically shaking. And then we, you know, go into her apartment and, you know, I I just kind of come clean, you know, with with everything. And she knew a lot of my story, but, you know, some some she didn't. And my fear was that like I loved her so much and I wanted to spend the rest of my life with her. But my fear was that if she, you know, knew like all of me, that she wouldn't love me and that she wouldn't, she wouldn't want to marry me. And I remember 
kind of getting it all out and everything. And then she just grabbed me with her arms and drew me, you know, like close. And I, by this time I was just bawling, you know, and I could even feel in the embrace and the, the words that she shared with me that we were closer now that somehow in the, in the mystery of God's grace and, and mercy, she loved me actually more now having known all of me and me being in this very, you know, vulnerable like place. And, uh, that has stuck with me like ever since, like it was such a clear picture of God's mercy of how much he loves us. And that, that, and it, and it was, has been so strong, like ever since. So she would often, awfully often say like, I, I am maybe a spiritual leader or whatever, but she, she's, we all know the real truth, Tom, <laughs> you know, our wives, our wives are way out in front of us on those accounts. And you uh, know, what's amazing about that statement is that she didn't correct you on that last one. <laughs> no, 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 true. I would say the same thing, unquestionably the same thing. Yeah. yeah. That's yeah. beautiful. What a, what a beautiful way of honoring each other, by the way, that you just did very naturally there. What you see in each other's, you know, brokenness as well as strengths weaknesses um as your you know marriage evolved and you you know your careers developed and your children came and right so many of those things can introduce into a marriage and you talked about during your dating to being you know being concerned that it was taking away from your focus on the lord so with all those things over these years uh maybe maybe you just reflect on how you keep your focus on the lord and and on each other with all of these things swirling around you any mm. thoughts on that mm. Well, I got a story that makes me, it doesn't, it doesn't, it's just not, not a great light on me and, and more of once again, you know, the beautiful light of God on my, my, my bride. I was in a, this place, like many of us are, you're, you're in a job and you're working hard and you're starting a, you, know, you bought a house, you start a family, like it's just stressful. Like just life is full and it's stressful. There's all these like new things. And uh, I was working harder than I ever had, like in my job. And it just, it just seemed like the work was endless and the fruit was little. It just, it, it wasn't, it wasn't like the contract that I'd made up in my mind between me and God. Like if I work hard, you know, and I really give myself, then all this fruit, it, you know, is going to, going to happen. It just, it just wasn't. And I remember like we had just, we had bought a house and for us, we had waited to have a family until we, we bought a house. We we're trying to be responsible, like young, like adults. And uh, so we, the, the house, it wasn't like a materialistic thing, but it was more like a symbol, like of this stability for our family. So we <clears> bought <throat> the house, got pregnant with Jackson, had a baby and we were, you know, living life. And things were not going well, like in my job. And part of it was like the, the resources, the financial resources, you know, like weren't there. And so like, as I'm watching that reality, like creep up on me, uh, you know, I, it was causing so much stress, you know, like, oh my gosh, is, are we going to make it, you know, like, do I know where we're, how we're going to pay the bills, you know, for the, the next month. And here I have this family and we have this mortgage and we're house poor, you know, and all, all these things. And I remember we were in an argument and, uh, and, 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 you know, the, our voices were being raised and I didn't think that she adequately understood how serious this was. Like, I didn't, I don't think that she, she knew. And at the height of this, you know, like argument, you know, I just yelled, you know, like, I don't think you understand. We're going to lose this effing house. Mm. And I don't cuss often, you know, yes. but I felt like yes. in that moment it was it was appropriate just to make get, you know, the point across. <laughs> and I remember her. I felt like she drew a step closer and pointed at me and she said, I don't care. Like just directly, you know, into my eyes. And what she was saying was, I, you think I care about this house? Do you think I care about anything material? Like, I don't care what, whether we lose a house. I don't care if we have to live in a cardboard box. It's like, I'm not going anywhere. And our love isn't going, you know, like anywhere. So it's like, it's an it's a example of her, like me getting caught up 
caught up in the world and its symbols and, you know, all of this. <clears throat> and she was anchoring me to the core of what this was wow. all about, mm -hmm. you know? So she, wow. she helps uh, me stay grounded a lot, you know, like as my life uh, swirls, you know, like so much. And I would say, <clears throat> excuse me, early on during that same season. I mean, I think that I think the beginning of marriage is the hardest you know, is some of the hardest or can be at least it was for us. <clears throat> we learned we actually that was a season of us going to marriage counseling because we were, we were just coming up against this conflict that we couldn't resolve. And a lot there was just a lot of stress in our life. And he, I was resistant. I mean, I'm, I'm a German farm girl. You just, you, you pull it up by your bootstraps, you find a way forward and you don't talk about your emotions. And I mean, that was what initially drew me to him as what I loved about him was his ability to go deeper and to live past the surface and draw yeah. things out of people. You know, and you know this about him, Tom, like he, he speaks to the heart and to the depths of the soul. And so True. that was such a draw for me, but a year into our marriage, it was becoming, it was becoming this, I mean, we were just at odds and he presented the idea of counseling and I was just not there and I was so resistant. Um, but it came out of his priority of our marriage and being proactive. And it was, it was not because we were on the verge of breaking, but it was because he wanted us to be on the verge of healing, you know, and kind of what was really revealing during that season for us is, you know, we truly felt like our marriage was ordained by God. We knew that in the beginning, but then you get into the rut of life and the rhythms and the, the chaos of kids and all of that. And something just happens and you can so easily get frustrated with the other person and forget what it was that drew you together in the first place. And our counselor did such a great job of pointing out something to us that has stuck with us for a long time. And she talked about this idea of lost, lost parts and that as a child, you, you're, you're, you need to have these four quadrants of your life in order to have like full and holistic health as a child, right? And by no fault of their own, different families are stronger in different things, right? And so she handed us these two sheets and we fill them out. And it was very clear that we were, we were filling each other's lost parts by finding each other. You know, my family is very action oriented, very service oriented. Michael's family is more intellectual, more emotionally. They can have conversations, um, more affectionate in that sense. And so we were kind of, that's what drew us together but then that comes the very thing that you're at odds with, with one another, because you, you don't know how to function together in that. Um, you can add to this if I'm. Yeah. It's almost like a, like a muscle, you know, where like if, if she's really strong in something and I'm, I'm drawn to that because that's an area where I'm like deficient in my life, like I'm drawn to it. And, and the relationship is part of the healing process, you know, for, for us. Um, but it's almost like a muscle. Like she's super strong. She can lift like a hundred pounds in this particular quadrant, but I can only lift two. Well, um, because I love her and we, we just are engaging in natural life. She's lifting a hundred pounds. She thinks that's normal, you know, like that everybody, you know, does that. It's very unconscious and I'm trying over and over and over. And yet I'm failing, you know, like I'm failing and I'm failing and I'm failing. So the very thing that I was attracted to her for, that was a part of my healing is becoming a point of <clears throat> resentment, you know, like now, mm -hmm. because it just, I, I can't get beyond, you know, like my mm -hmm. own failure. And once yeah. like we, this was kind of revealed this model and it's just a theory, but I think it makes sense. And it's really helped us in our, in, in our marriage, but has really helped because you identify it and it is part of your healing, but you have to calibrate to one another. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, all right, mm -hmm. I had to calibrate. I had the funniest story. I think one, one of the funny stories when we first got married, and uh, I envision you have all these expectations about like what like marriage is going to be like. And part of our maybe nighttime routine, I thought was going to be like, I have my stack of books on my nightstand and she has her stack of books and we sit up in bed and we read and then we say, oh, hon, this is very interesting. Like, let me share, share with you what this is about. And then we have this like talk and whatever. And uh, this is why he has friends like you, Tom. Yes. Yes. Me and Tom do this at night before we snuggle. And, uh, so, so I thought this is the way it's going to happen. So we, we got married and we're like, Hey, do you want to do a devotional? You know, it's like, sure. And then first night comes and I said, do you want to start? She said, yes. And so she, she opens up the devotional and we're, lay, we're just sitting there and she, she reads it. And then at the end, the last, uh, line was said, and then she just went like this and, <laughs> and put it down and like rolled over or something. And I'm like, ah, uh, you know, like this, this is, this is when we talk. No, not a talk. Okay. All right. 
But like to her, what I I did not realize what was going on. She describes it later as there was a hundred pound weight on her chest. She felt the pressure of, oh my gosh, now we have to like talk about this. And it wasn't like it was super deeply penetrating or anything, but it was way more than what she was like used to or accustomed to. And likewise, like if something breaks in the house, I feel like a hundred pound weight. Cause like I, it's broke. I mean, I, I don't know. I don't know how to fix that, you know? <laughs> and, and, and she's like, did you look at it? Did you, <laughs> did you examine did you use a screwdriver? Yes. Did you, did you examine? I was like, no, I did it. It was just, it was just, just broken. It. <laughs> I just let it be broken. But the beauty, I will say, the rounding out of all of that is having been through that now, mm. seeing how God's healing in our marriage is growing us. Because this is like, he wants all of us to be healthy, right? Not just these certain, like, these certain actions or these certain orientations. And he doesn't want Michael to get stuck in contemplation. He doesn't want me to get stuck in action. And so the beauty of us together is just this rounding out of these lost parts that I feel like that's been, that's been a gift from the Lord. The other thing I will say too, is like, this is hands down and kind of assumed, but I think we live in a culture and a world where everything idolizes marriage or has this fan fantasy reality to what marriage is. Like this is your, you, your, you will find happiness when you find the perfect person and this, don't get me wrong. This is the most amazing man that God has set before me without a doubt, but he is not my savior. And if I ever put that weight on him to fill the gap in the void that God wants, I think the hardest times in our marriage is when our faith life, our prayer life is not good because we're expecting, we're expecting this person to do what only God can do. So even in the greatest moments, Michael's still only human and he can't love me like the Lord can. And so the, the reality of having the safety net of Jesus in our marriage for both of us has been the saving grace. There's no way our marriage would be what it is without the safe space of a relationship with our Lord and Savior. There's just no doubt in my mind. So we we would talk to, uh, you know, give talks to like college students uh, or high school students on on relationships often. And we all would we always would pull out this triangle like model mm -hmm. that, you know, like, all right, if I'm down here on this and, and you're down here on, on this corner, the tendency is to just be attracted and drawn to one another. And that's part of it. Yes. But like if God is at the top here on the on the top part of the pyramid, it's like you're the closest distance between you and the love of your life, the one that God has ordained for you is, is, is the Lord himself. Draw close to the Lord primarily, and he will lead you to that person. But the same thing is true while you're in the relationship mm -hmm. is like, all right, the tendency, like she was saying, is just to, to put too much pressure for her to, you know, fulfill all of my expectations and my needs and overcome all my inadequacies. And she can't do that, you know, mm -hmm. and it's usually because I'm not, I don't have my eyes fixed like on, on the Lord. Mm -hmm. And so I don't know, it's been out of absolute necessity, mm -hmm. often desperate necessity, you know, that we run into problems. Then we just fall on our knees and beg to the Lord to have mercy like mm -hmm. on us like every morning I get out of bed and Lord Jesus Christ, son of the living God, have mercy on me a sinner. Like, cause that's, that's the way I start, you know, my day. Because I know, I know it to be true, and it's the same in our marriage. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, that, so so the last part here, I wanted to ask you if you would give some advice to um, a group of engaged couples that were at a pre cana So you've already done a ton of that, <laughs> you know, just by the beautiful witness you just shared with your own marriage and how you struggled through these things. But if if I asked you, you know, to give a talk. And you saw all these couples, you know, mixed, maybe they have mixed backgrounds in terms of faith or where they're at in their faith or wherever. But what kind of things would you say now, 18 years into your marriage and all the other, you know, experiences you've talked about, would you say to them, really pay attention to these things? What kinds of things would you share? Got anything? I mean, one, one thing comes to mind is, is, um, is safe places. Like, it's amazing to me like how how few people believe and know that they have a safe place you know i heard this statistic the other day like that that uh some 
I, I don't remember what it was, but incredibly low percentage of even uh, people in pastoral ministry mm. believed that they had even one good friend, you know, or close friend that they could really be real with and confide, you know, in, which is so sad, but I think it's true. And like, even in, in, in marriage, uh, sometimes it, it has, a, there's always a temptation to pull towards entropy to, for things to fall apart, for things not to be safe and, you know, to create a truly safe place, like for, for, for her to, to, for her to know every day that I, I am, I'm not going to leave you, mm -hmm. that I'm always going to be here. And, uh, that I love her no, no matter what, like she loved me in my worst moment, you know? Like when I'm revealing the, the, you know, the most unlovable parts like of me that she loves me in that moment, you know, it creates that safety, that little kingdom bubble, you know, an extension of God's, you know, she magnifies God's relationship, you know, with me. And I think that's like super important to have that sort of mm -hmm. safe space, you yeah. know, mm -hmm. in marriage and for her to know that. And for my behavior, my words, you know, my, my actions to convey that over and over like just as a foundation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I would say two things come to mind. One to know that you're not alone. Like no marriage is perfect. It's it, there's such, it's because we're imperfect human sinful beings. Like we're never going to be perfect. And so I think sometimes people look at certain couples and idolize them or think, Oh, I wish my marriage was more like this, or I wish my husband was more like this, but but so that is, that's of the evil one. And is just a really dangerous and tricky, tricky place to go. But then the other places like is expectations. Um, I'll say this from the female brain. Sometimes I feel like he can read my mind um, or it should be so obvious. Isn't my body language telling you <laughs> what I think you should know I'm saying in my head? Um, but what do we just hear? Expectations are premedit premeditated resentments. resentments. <laughs> Expectations are premeditated resentments. And that's one I thing that I've had that. to learn. Wow. As a Could you say that again, by the way? Would you just say that one more time? Yeah. Expectations are premeditated resentments. Wow. So I've always felt like somebody who didn't have, who couldn't really say what I thought or what I was thinking because I don't want to inconvenience anybody. So it would always just kind of stuff stuff. And the reality is, is he doesn't know that I want him to help me pack the car before we go to mass. I don't want to be doing it by myself. He's just getting the car waiting to go, but I'm inside. I'm fuming. And so as a woman, I've learned to just, just theoretically, <laughs> this is like a theoretical <laughs> This never happens on or off camera. <laughs> but in all of that, like, I just think as women, our brains are so multifaceted and this is, you know, we know that a man's brain can be more linear. And so I think to be able to communicate what I need out loud, instead of expecting him to just read my mind is something I'm still working on and trying to do. But then also finding the relationships with people that we can be honest about our marriage in the struggles in a way that is honoring because I've been in circles where it becomes dishonoring and not loyal. And I'm cautious. Like, of what those do you mean by that? Um, we start just complaining about our husbands because they're not doing everything we want them to do. And when that starts to happen, I turn away and run in the opposite direction. Now, do I have friends that I trust that I can say, Hey, pray for us. Cause we're really struggling. Or do you have any wisdom and how to handle this? It's different, but always, always, always honor and respect because this is, nobody's perfect, but find those safe spaces, not only in your marriage, but also with other people that you can talk through this stuff because no marriage, even the one that looks perfect on the outside is perfect on the inside. So don't mm. think that you're ever going to be in that space because it does get hard. So, mm. Mm. yeah. And it's, and it's work like, yeah, anybody yeah. who's been married for, for a long time's work, it's, it's worth it. You know, like it's so, it's so good. It's worth investing in. And sometimes you feel like, well, if it's right, if it's really good, and especially you throw faith in here and it can get dangerous. It's like, well, this is God ordained. And so we're gonna, you know, we're smooth sailing and, um, no, I mean, just like anything, it, it need, we need to be, we need tune-ups. Like sometimes we need surgery and like if something's broke and I remember, I remember like in our, in our marriage, we, we felt like we were bumping up against the same invisible wall over and over. And we were having the same arguments. We were saying the exact same things in those arguments but never moving towards like uh, a solution or reconciliation. And at that point, it's just like, <clears throat> just, just get the help that you need. Mm 
mm-hmm. and find the, the right person. And, and not every therapist or, or counselor is going to be the right person. We've been to a few that, that weren't the right person, you know, and, uh, but, but how, but how important that, that is. And this helped us tremendously. Oh and then we like, just because we have been through, uh, uh some processes of, of healing, then we, we can extend that to other people and share that with others and then have, I guess, a, a bit of courage or, or vulnerability to say, oh yeah, we struggle with that. And we, you know, we went to counseling and other people gone to counseling. And at that stage in their life, that was the biggest thing. Like, oh my gosh, we're going to counseling. Like, is it over? Like, could this be? And so I don't know, like get the help that you need mm-hmm. and just be, be honest about it. You know, Augie broke his leg the other day. Go to the doctor. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And we have no shame about that, but there's kind of a, there, there is a, a bit of shame that can creep into a marriage situation, you know, like, like I, 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 and I don't know what was, Tasha was more resistant than I was, but I don't, and maybe you could talk about what that was. I don't know if we have time. <laughs> I don't know if we have time. She <laughs> yeah, said. That might be another podcast. <laughs> well, why, why don't we save that for part two, which we will have, by the way, I want to do, I would love to do this again and, and other aspects of your life, especially as people who work uh, in the church for young life and how that kind of factors into your marriage. I, my wife and I have the same situation. So it's an interesting world for people who don't have that experience to get a sense of what that means and what it looks like. And then who do would appreciate the witness. My, my last question I want to ask both of you pretty, pretty straightforward is if you had to say about each other, what your favorite quality is, what would it be? And I'll begin with Tasha and then, and then Michael, your favorite quality. Right, um, Tasha will go first. Um, Michael, she just told me what I should say. No, I said don't. Say that. <laughs> That's not true. Yes. Um, for sure, for sure. Number one, his spiritual leadership, his his relationship with Christ is my favorite quality. He's a lot of fun. He still can. I mean, he's he's not only is he like attractive and can pull off a mustache at this age, you know, but he's gonna <laughs> have fun and we still have fun together. Um. And his ability to really enter in to people's lives um, and to know people, you know, and to go past the surface um, is a total gift. So, mm. And ma- marriage is show, it, marriage is like a mirror. And man, when I look in the mirror, that is Tasha, I realize how often selfish I am and how selfless she is. She's the m- most selfless person that I know she's always thinking about others, always doing things for, for others, always making a connection for the sake of, of others, you know, like I'll leave for a trip and it's very likely that I'll come home and there'll be other human beings like in our house, you know, it's like, Oh yeah, I've taken, I've taken those people like in and they needed a place to stay. And then, yeah, I have a bunny. Remember that time that I came back and there was a bunny (laughs) like in our house. It's like, why is there a bunny like in our house? Well, I don't remember. They went on a trip and they needed somebody to take care. Like it just, it's so natural. Whereas I have more boundaries. You know, it's like, well, we gotta, we gotta kind of maintain what we got here and life is hard enough. There's always room for another person at our table and, and in our household and in our life. And it's because of her. Wow. That's a, that's a beautiful witness. And, and you know, one of the things, if anyone knows Tasha and Michael up close is what you've seen a bit here, which is their joy and laughter that they have together, which uh, is contagious. Uh, your, your love for each other. Uh, I'm so grateful. I can't tell you for your willingness to be on, on this podcast and to share yourselves, your life, your hearts, uh, all of that with people. I know it will bless many people who see this and, I have to say, above all, people will be blessed by your mustache, Michael. But we're going to do a close up now. We're going to zoom in right now. Can we zoom into that? Yeah. We, no way. Later. Good, good. We're going to do a zoom in, and, and that will be kind of, and then we had said before, we're going to do 2001 A Space Odyssey music as we go in. Great. <laughs> so, so to, 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 to pull all this together, which is not possible, could I ask, Michael, since Tasha complimented you as spiritual leader, would you end with a prayer to lift us all uh, up to the Lord? Yeah, happy to. Father and Son and Holy Spirit. Amen. Thanks. Thank you for being so close to us. And thank you for revealing yourself so abundantly in relationship. 
um, in the relationship with this blessed person, uh, Tom, but also in marriage, how you reveal yourself to us and pour out your mercy and your love and your um, beauty so lavishly in marriage. It is it's just overwhelming and uh, so inspiring and uh, so energizing. And so thank you, Lord, for the gift and the, the blessing, the covenant of, of marriage. And Lord, allow us in, in that marriage covenant to be faithful to one another in a, in a way that you are faithful to us. And in that sense, like reveal yourself to, to the world that is, is so desperately in need of, of love and of safe places and of mercy. So, uh, so thank you, Lord, for all that you, you are and you do for us. Thank you for your son who reveals to us the, 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 in a perfect way who you are and who you are to us and how much you love us. We give you this day and we give you this podcast and this mustache. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs> Father, Son, Holy Spirit. <laughs> That's beautiful. The the beautiful the Lord. <laughs> It's a beautiful prayer, and it shows that God wants everything, even Michael's mustache. So thank you so much. It was a, I love you guys so much, and it was a great pleasure to have you on and an honor to have you on. And I say to all the listeners, thank you so much for joining me and us for another podcast edition of Sharing the Faith. Please join us again in two weeks, and may the Lord bless you in the meantime with his abundant mercy. Thank you for tuning in today to the Sharing the Faith podcast. If you would like to learn more about the podcast, visit ptdiocese.org slash sharing the faith. If you listen to the audio version through an app such as Apple Podcast, Spotify, or iHeartRadio, be sure to rate, review, and comment. If you watched on YouTube, be sure to like and subscribe or leave a comment on the episode. Thank you for listening.